Hello everyone, my name is Minhal. I'm a PhD student in Professor Mark Wilson's group in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Toronto. And today I wanted to talk to you about the recent work I've just completed where we've used sub band gap modulation to alter the blinking statistics in quantum dots and modify the power loss slopes. And so just a little motivation to start. Of course, we all know that quantum dots are great fluorophores. We use them for LEDs, we use them for biomedical imaging. And here in the middle, I'm showing you one of my colleagues is using them as triplet synthesizers for excitonic up conversion. And so just a quick overview of the materials we're using today. It's the canonical standard system for studying blinking. We have cadmium selenide overcoated with a shell of zinc sulfide. So as we all know, these materials blink, i.e. their fluorescence turns on and off. And so here what I'm showing you is just an example of the fluorescence intensity versus time of a single cadmium selenide quantum dot under continuous wave excitation. And what you can see here is that the signal rapidly and randomly switches between these two high and low states. If we zoom in on this red box that I've outlined here, we can see that it continues in a self-similar fashion over many time scales. The way we analyze this data is to threshold the intensity traces I've indicated with this red dashed line, and we assign any signal above the threshold to the on state and below to the off state. We can also histogram the fluorescence intensity to get this bimodal distribution, which suggests that we're really switching between two states. After thresholding, we find the frequency of the durations of each on and off event and plot them to generate a probability distribution. If we plot the probabilities in a log log plot, we get something unexpected. Typically, as physical chemists, we're used to working with exponentially distributed quantities and first order kinetics, but instead we see something that looks like a power law and extends over many orders of magnitude in time and in probability. If we look in the literature, we often see that the slope of this power law distribution sits around 1.5. This is the ubiquitous power law slope that we're all familiar with. And additionally, the off state is not truncated on timescales we can see experimentally, particularly in single dot spectroscopy. Things get a little weirder when we look at the on state. We still have this power law decay with about the same exponent, but the on state comes with an exponential truncation. The implication here is that dots will turn off in the long time limit, which is obviously detrimental if we're using quantum dots as fluorophores. And so the experiment we wanted to do is find a new observable, find a new handle to investigate what's really going on with blinking. Historically, fluorescence has been the dominant observable that we look at, and so we were looking to see if we could augment this or do something to the fluorescence that could give us more insight into what's going on. And so the idea I had was to use a depletion beam tuned to the stimulated emission transition in these particular dots to see if we could perturb their blinking and their blinking statistics. Here on the top right, I show you the absorption and emission spectra of these dots, and then in red, the spectrum of the beam I chose to deplete the band edge carriers with the hope that any blinking we see will then comment on the contributions from hot carriers because we know there's differences in the blinking from hot and cooled carriers. And so we chose a wavelength to minimize the direct excitation of the dot, 637 nanometers, on the red edge of the emission spectrum. And hopefully we're able to look at the photons coming from the dot without too much laser scattering. So we did the experiment, and this is what the data looks like. Here in the low periods, I have just the excitation laser on, and we see regular binary blinking just as we expect. In the high periods here, I have both the excitation and modulation laser on, and it looks like the same binary blinking, except with this increased background, which we'll come to in a second. And so to analyze this data, we split the photon streams into modulated or unmodulated components and proceed with our regular blinking analysis. We'll threshold the intensity traces, generate the histograms, and the important thing here is that you can see the bimodality is obvious, not only in the unmodulated data, but also in the modulated data, indicating we have strong evidence for on and off states. Unfortunately, coming back to the background, things aren't that simple. And here I show you an example of another experiment that we ran with the exact same parameters. However, this time the background during modulation is clearly drifting in this blue trace here. It obviously would be incorrect and unjustified then to use a constant intensity threshold in this case. And so what we did is develop a background subtraction algorithm so that we could flatten out the background and be able to compare the modulated and unmodulated data equivalently. So here on the right in red is our algorithm tracking the background. We then subtract it off to give us the trace below. We get a nice flat background. Evidence for this working is that when we regenerate the histograms of the intensity distributions, you can see the bimodality is still there. And to really be able to compare properly, what we decided to do is subtract off all of the off counts from each modulated and unmodulated trace, such that the off intensities are centered about zero. What we find then after the subtraction technique is that looking at the peak of the on histograms, the dot is a little bit darker or giving us less photons when the modulation is on. 
which is evidence for us being able to deplete some of the band edge carriers. And so after all this background subtraction, we can histogram the durations and do our regular blinking analysis. What we find is that the off state is unaffected. So here in the blue is the modulated data and the green, the unmodulated data. We get almost identical slopes. They look about the same. We get roughly the power loss slope that we would expect from literature. But things get a little bit more interesting when we look at the on data. We get something that we really didn't expect, which is that the power loss slopes from the modulated data actually increase, and they increase quite a bit. We didn't really predict this. We thought that adding a second beam would just contribute to speeding up the truncation times, but instead we get a change in the power loss slope that makes the distribution steeper, and a larger slope implies suppressed long on times. And so to make sure this is real and have some statistical significance, we did this across 20 different dots, and this is what we see. So here what I'm showing you is the fitted off slopes for these 20 dots in green without modulation and in blue with modulation. I plotted them in increasing order of unmodulated slope and what we see here is that the modulated slope in blue really is unaffected. The blue circles are pretty equally distributed above and below the green circles and if you look at the averages on the right here we see that the slopes are statistically indistinguishable. By contrast looking at the on slopes we see a clear increasing trend. So this is the exact same data for the dots below. These are the same dots that we did the experiments on. And again, the green circles are plotted in increasing order. But now the corresponding modulated data appears to lie above the unmodulated data in almost every case. Again, looking to the right, we see a very clear change in the average slope. It's statistically significant. And additionally, what the red dashed line is showing you is the average effect of the modulation. So that means if you take the unmodulated slope and add to that the average slope change, you get the red line, which seems to broadly line up with the observed modulated data. To be sure this was a real effect, we repeated the same experiment with another laser, this time shifted to 785 nanometers in wavelength so that it has no overlap with any special features of the dot, either in the ground or excited state. And as you can see in the figure in the bottom, in the red circles, at all the modulation powers we looked at at the 785, it really didn't do anything. So here in the red, I'm showing you the change in on slope as a function of 785 nanometer beam power, and really, really nothing happened. We also checked the intensity dependence of the 637 nanometer beam, and we had the clearest results at the highest power, which is what I've been de demonstrating throughout this entire presentation. At the lower powers, the data is a little unclear, though there's some evidence to suggest that the effect may be nonlinear, but it's something we're still working on. Turning back to the on slopes, we noticed that the change at our highest modulation power seemed characteristic. It seems to affect every dot the same way, regardless of the initial slope was, and it seemed to have the same amount of effect each time. It really did seem to be scale free and increases almost the same amount for each dot. We find it a little bit curious that our average slope change was close to a half integer number. And we started to think about other ways that slope changes could arise. Initially, we thought it might be via stimulated emission, but it's not obvious to me how that would give an, a, a rise to an effect like this because we figured that any extra, excitations, any extra excitations would just cause the truncation time to speed up. When we looked at the truncation times, we really saw no change. In terms of a mechanism, we don't think it's enhanced by exciton generation or any other linear processes for the same reason. We really would just expect a change in truncation times. Um, and I won't mention here, but I did do the calculations to check exactly how much the modulation beam was contributing to direct absorption. We also decided that was the do dominant effect. In terms of a microscopic mechanistic origin behind what we're seeing, to be honest, I'm not really sure, but we started thinking about the Marcus diffusion controlled model and whether sub band gap modulation can perhaps perturb the diffusion of quantum dot energy levels. However, this is very tentative and it's something that we've really just started thinking about. And so just to wrap up, I hope I've shown you that we can take advantage of the characteristic intermittency and dynamically subtract a drifting background and isolate the effects of sub band gap modulation. As a result, even just qualitatively, we can see that long duration on events are suppressed and that the change looks to be scale free, selective to the on state and robust to our methods of analysis. With that, I'd like to thank my group, my professor Mark Wilson and all of you for attention and I'm happy to take any questions.